Welcome back, everyone. We are so grateful that you have joined us for a second day of Intro to Insects. Yesterday, we focused on where insects fit into a bigger picture, where they are like other arthropods, and then what makes them a little bit unique. We're going to expand on what makes them a unique a little bit, and then start breaking down the groups of insects uh, in the world. So remember, all arthropods have exoskeletons, segmented bodies, and paired appendages. And all insects have six legs, three pairs. They have three segments to their body, a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. And they have, if wings are there, one or two pairs. So there are roughly 25 plus groups of insects, each with unique features, some of which are debated on whether they should be unique groups, and that conversation still goes on to this day, but 25-ish groups of insects in the world, each with unique features. We will be talking about some of them in more detail than others, but we are about to get started with our groups of insects. Here we go. So today we are going to be talking about the groups of insects. We are going to give you the scientific names. So it's gonna be a lot of big words, but we will explain each of the groups. A lot of species are probably going to sound familiar. There's gonna be a new, couple of new ones for you. But a lot of it is you already knew those things, you just didn't necessarily know how they were broken down. So the first groups that we are gonna talk about are what I'm going to call the big five. The majority of known insect species fall in five orders. So uh, over 75% of known insect species are in one of these five groups. And those five groups are we have Coleoptera, which is beetles. And remember from yesterday, that is over half. So over 380,000 species of insects are beetles. Then we have Diptera, which are flies, and there's a lot of diversity in flies. We have Hymenoptera, which is our bees, ants, and wasps are all in this group, very familiar and very diverse as well. And then we have Hemiptera, which are what we call our true bugs. Now Hemiptera is one of those that some people think that it should be in two different groups based on what's there. We'll go into that a little bit more, uh, but there is a little bit of contention about how Hemiptera should be organized. And then our last one in the big five is Lepidoptera. These are our butterflies and moths, and if you are not a fan of any other insect, just about everybody enjoys moths and butterflies. So we're gonna start breaking these down a little bit, talk about the features that they have in some representative species, and then we'll work on our lesser known insects. Hello, my name is Jordan, and today I will be giving you a brief tour of the Mississippi Entomological Museum wherein I will talk about the various different orders of insects. Now, insects as a whole are grouped into large groups called orders um, that can contain tens of thousands of species or even hundreds of thousands of species sometimes. Now, these orders all have Greek and Latin names and I'll be explaining them as I go along. Now, depending on who you ask, there can be from 28 to 32 individual insect orders. So like I said, we're going to be giving a, a brief tour of the Mississippi Entomological Museum today. Now this is a really fascinating place. It's been around for decades and decades, uh, and we have specimens of preserved insects in the museum that have been here for over a hundred years. Now the Mississippi Entomological Museum is the largest housing of dried insect specimens in the state of Mississippi. Uh, we actually house over 1.6 million specimens in the museum, uh, so obviously I will only be able to show you a small taste of what we have here today. Now, normally under better, better circumstances, we have tours that actually come into the museum where I'll show groups of students all around it and show them the high points. 
and because things are a bit strange right now, we're only able to show you them through video. So I will just be giving you a brief overview of all the different orders that we have here in the museum, and hopefully we can see you again in the future. The first order we're going to start off with is the Coleoptera, or the beetles. Now, in Greek and in Latin, Coleoptera means sheath wing, and it refers to the hardened hind wings of the beetle that act as a shell. Now, beetles are extremely diverse, and they're extremely successful in the animal kingdom, mostly because of these hardened back wings. They basically allow them both mobility, because they're relatively light, and protection from predators. So beetles are essentially like tiny little tanks that are roaming around in the environment. Uh, and because of their success, they are extremely diverse. There are over 386,000 species of beetle in the world, and those are just the ones that we know about. Um, it is estimated that there are probably double or triple that number of species of beetles in the world, especially in the tropics. Now, beetles are extremely diverse, both in their form and in their feeding habits and in where they live. They actually inhabit basically every environment on Earth except for the open ocean, and they feed on almost every food source you can imagine. There are beetles that feed on other insects, on plants, on decaying organic matter, even carrion and animal droppings. Now, all beetles are going to have chewing mouth parts along with their hardened shells, so that's one of the things that makes them uh, identifiable as beetles. The second largest order of insects is called the Lepidoptera. Now, Lepidoptera is derived from the words Lepido and Optera, which means scale and then wing. And the reason why they're called that is because if you look at Lepidopterans' wings underneath the microscope, they have these teeny tiny little scales that completely coat the wings and give them all of their amazing colors and patterns. Now, the Lepidoptera are one of the most famous orders because they include the butterflies, and they also include the moths. There are over 157,000 species of Lepidoptera worldwide, again, just the ones that we know about, and over 90% of those species are actually moths. What's interesting about the Lepidoptera is that the butterflies are kind of a group on their own, whereas the moths comprise pretty much everything else. And you can tell butterflies and moths apart based off of their antenna. Butterflies will have these little clubs that look like Q-tip at the end of their antennae, whereas moths have pretty much everything else. Uh, they have sucking mouth parts. They usually have a long, bendy straw-like mouth part that uncoils like a party favor, and they use it to drink up liquids from all sorts of different food sources. Their primary source of food is flower nectar, but they also feed on sweat, mud, carrion, animal droppings, and even rotting fruit. Now, the Mississippi Entomological Museum specializes in moths in particular, and a large proportion of our collection is actually made up of moths. It is a common misconception that most flying insects only have two wings. In fact, most insects will actually have four wings, but there is one group that does only have truly two wings, and they are the diptera. Now the diptera is an easy word, you break it in half, di means two and terra means wing, so it refers to their two-winged habit. Now, like many other insect orders with wings, the second pair of wings has been modified in this order. Uh, and in the case of the diptera, the second pair of wings has been modified into these tiny little lollipop-like structures called haltiers and they basically stick out and they're allowed to vibrate to uh, allow the fly to orient itself in its environment and keep its balance when it's flying and doing all of its amazing aerial maneuvers. Now there are many different insects that are called flies, like fireflies and dragonflies and scorpionflies, but the, only the true flies will have two wings. And the way that you can tell, at least when they're written, is that true flies will be divided up into two words, like a crane fly or a bot fly, whereas words like dragonfly or scorpion fly are all one word. So that's one of the ways that you can tell whether something's a true fly or not if you're reading about it. Now, flies are one of those extremely large orders, just like the other ones we've just discussed. They have over 150,000 known species in the world, and like the others, probably have many more that are yet undescribed. 
Now flies, like the beetles, have colonized almost every habitat on Earth. There are even flies that live in the Arctic, and in order to do this, they've shed their wings and only crawl around on the ground. Uh, now flies feed on all sorts of different food sources as well, with their sucking or sponging mouth parts. Um, any insect that has chewing mouth parts you know isn't going to be a true fly, because the true flies will only have mouth parts that are used for feeding on liquids. The next of the big five orders is one of my personal favorites. It's called the Hymenoptera, and it includes both the ants, the bees, and the wasps. Now, Hymenoptera is built up of two words, hymeno, meaning married, and optera, meaning wing. And this refers to the fact that ants, bees, and wasps have these tiny little hooks on the margins of their wings that allow them to essentially velcro together so that they can function as uh, individual wings. Now a small number of the Hymenoptera are very familiar to us. Uh, we're all familiar with the fire ants, we're all familiar with the bumblebees and the paper wasps and the yellow jackets, but many of the Hymenoptera, uh, over a hundred thousand species of them, are actually solitary Hymenoptera as opposed to living in colonies. And these solitary Hymenoptera are not seen very frequently by people unless you're looking for them. Now solitary bees will come in all these amazing different colors and forms, and they actually do a lot of our pollination services for us. Solitary wasps come in even more variety, and most of them have an interesting lifestyle called parasitoidism, where they lay eggs on or inside of a host insect, and then the young wasps will eat the host insect from the inside out over a period of time. Now, the hosts of these parasitoid wasps are mostly going to be insects and spiders, but they can branch off into other organisms as well. We commonly call creepy, crawling arthropods and other things with hard shells bugs, but in actuality, the only true bugs belong to the order Hemiptera. Now, Hemiptera is broken up into the words hemi, meaning half, and optera, meaning wing. And this refers to how a lot of the true bugs will have a little fold in their wing that allows their wing to kind of fold in half. One half of their wing is more thick and leathery than the other half. So now there are over 103,000 species of the Hemiptera, making them the last of the orders in our big five. They are characterized by having piercing and sucking mouth parts. Not a single one of the true bugs will have any chewing mouth parts. They're all going to feed on liquids. They have two pairs of wings, making a total of four, and usually the outer wings are leathery and cover the inner, softer, more membranous wings. The Hemiptera includes a lot of famous insects such as stink bugs, assassin bugs, bed bugs, cicadas, and leafhoppers, among other things. So we spent a little bit of time talking about the big five, our major groups of insects. Now the rest of our insects that are on the planet are not as many in number, but they are out there. And more than likely you've seen some of these at some point and been startled by them, maybe didn't recognize what they were. Hopefully we will be able to give you an idea of what group of insect that that strange thing you saw uh, fit into. We are not going to cover all insect orders in this video today. We are going to cover the most um, diverse, the most uh, representative species and ones you are more likely to see in the Southeast United States. There are a few groups that are found in other parts of the world that have no representative species in this uh, area. And so we will not be covering those. So do not take this as an inclusive list of all insect groups. There are some we do not cover. So if you have questions about what those are, please let us know and we will try and get you more information about other insects you might be curious about. So the next large order that we're going to talk about is not one of the big five, but still has over 14,000 species. And it's an order that many fishermen might be familiar with. It's called the Trichoptera, or the caddisflies. Now the words trico and optera mean that it has hairy wings. 
Now they're a closely related order to the Lepidoptera, but instead of little microscopic scales on the wings, they have little tiny hairs that cover the wings. Now Trichoptera are fascinating because they live most of their lives as larvae underneath the water in fresh water, ponds, and flowing streams. And in these places, they will gather around little bits of sand, debris, or anything that they can find of a certain size and make little cases that allow them to protect their bodies. And they can drag these cases around with them as they feed on organic matter underneath the water. And they can draw their head back into the case like a turtle to protect themselves when predators are around. The next largest order that I'd like to cover is the Orthoptera, meaning straight wing. And the Orthopterans include the grasshoppers, the crickets, and the katydids. In general, the Orthoptera tend to be sort of elongate insects with strong legs modified for jumping, and they have chewing mouth parts, which they use to feed primarily on plants and other vegetation. So the main groups of the Orthoptera, the grasshoppers, crickets, and katydids, can be distinguished from each other based off of what their antennae look like. Grasshoppers tend to have shorter, more uh, thick or stubby antennae, whereas crickets and katydids have very long, thread-like antennae. Now, all in all, the Orthoptera has about 23,000 species worldwide, making them one of the most diverse of all of the smaller orders of insects. The next order that I would like to discuss is the Blatodia. Now, the Blatodia are commonly thought of as being uh, disgusting or pest insects because it includes the cockroaches. Now cockroaches are most familiar to us as living in our own habitats. Um, they live in houses and in cities and they feed on trash, but the vast majority of the 7,000 species of cockroaches in the world actually just live harmlessly on the forest floor where they break down organic matter and wood into the soil. Now a lot of times insect taxonomy is constantly changing. The way that we classify insects is constantly changing as we learn more and more about them. And an interesting new addition to the Blatodia in recent years has actually been the termites, because we have found out that genetically speaking, the termites are more closely related to the cockroaches than they are to any other insect. And so you can actually think of termites as being uh, specialized cockroaches that live in social colonies and continue to feed on decaying wood and organic matter the same way the cockroaches do. Next up is the Neuroptera. Now, Neuroptera is made up of the words neuro, meaning nerve or net, and optera, meaning wings. And this refers to the very um, complex vein structures of the Neuropteran wings, which actually gives them the English name, the lace wings. Now, some people might have seen lace wings before, and some people might not have. They're very common, but they're hard to notice at times. The best time to find the most common lace wings is right after a thunderstorm or during a thunderstorm, where they might be flying around lights and in other places around dwellings. Now, Neuroptera are almost all predators. They feed on other smaller insects, especially little plant pests like aphids and mealybugs, and they actually help us out a lot by protecting our crops from, uh, from herbivorous predators. The next order that I would like to discuss is the Thysanoptera, which is a somewhat large order that contains very small members. Most of the Thysanoptera, or thrips as they're called in English, are so small that you can almost not see them with the naked eye. However, they can be pretty important because they can destroy crops and flowers whenever we try and grow our own food or ornamental plants. Uh, and they can be an important pest of these plants. They're also food for the previous order that I mentioned, the Neuroptera. Now, Thysanoptera is built up of two words, Thysano meaning fringe and Optera meaning wing, which refers to this little fringe of tiny hairs that's on the hind margin of their wings, which makes them look like they have like little zippers on their wings. They're very strange little insects. The next order I'd like to discuss is called the Socoptera, and they're an interesting order because they are almost absolutely everywhere, and yet most people hardly ever see them. They are called the book lice, the bark lice, and the true lice more recently, um, as the true lice have been added to the Socoptera in recent years. 
Now the Socoptera inhabit all sorts of different habitats. They live on trees and foliage and in moss and on rocks and even out in the desert. And they feed on all sorts of little microscopic bacteria and fungi and algae. Uh, and they have colonized many of the different habitats on the face of the earth. Now the thing that is most recognizable about most of the Socoptera is if they have wings, the wings will typically be held in a roof-like fashion over their back, kind of making a triangle or a pyramid. Now, the true lice used to be included in their own order, but now they're grouped in with the Socoptera because we found that they're more closely related to each other than we previously thought. The true lice are familiar to humans because they can suck our blood, and they can cause itchiness, they can carry diseases, and they can hurt our animals and they're generally considered an overall pest. Now the Plecoptera is another order of aquatic insects that lives most of their lives underneath water in freshwater ponds and streams. Now they're not commonly seen by humans because they tend to be what are called indicators of water quality. They only live in places where the water is really pure and unpolluted. Uh, so you know that when you see the Plecoptera, or as they're more commonly known as stoneflies, then you know that the area that you're in has good water quality. The next order of insects, the Ephemeroptera, is most famous for having a really short adult lifespan. And in fact, that is actually what its name translates into. Ephemero, meaning short or fleeting, and Optera, meaning wing. Now the Ephemeroptera are an ancient order of insects. They're millions and millions of years old and they haven't changed very much in all that time. They tend to hold their wings up straight over their body and parallel with each other and they have these tiny little fringes, these hairs that come off of their tail that will stick out behind their body making them very recognizable. They will come out from their aquatic habitats whenever they emerge as adults in the millions and they will fly around all over the place, especially around lights, and you can find them on the sides of buildings in extremely large numbers where they'll be eaten and massed by birds and other predators. The next order that I'm going to talk about are the Phasmatodia, the walking sticks. Now, the walking sticks are a very well-known order, even though they're not seen very frequently, and the reason why is obvious. They look just like sticks and plant matter, and whenever they're walking around during the day, they will actually be totally still in the branches of trees and bushes. So it's almost impossible to see them when they're in their natural habitat. Now there are over 3,000 species of walking sticks throughout the world. And depending on how you measure it, one of the largest insects in the world is in fact a walking stick. It can be the length of your forearm, or almost two feet long in length. The next order that I want to discuss is the Mantodia, the praying mantids. Now these are a really famous order even though they're not seen terribly commonly. There are around 2,000 species worldwide and they come in an amazing array of shapes and forms. Some of them can be camouflaged to look like certain flowers and orchids, and some of them can get really really large, up to 6 or 7 inches in length. The most distinct trait of the praying mantids is their what are called raptorial forelegs, which they hold in front of their body like a velociraptor or a T-Rex. Now these forelegs are pretty much spring-loaded and they can fire them out in front of their body to catch incoming prey and snatch flies and even small birds out of the air. And another thing about praying mantids that's really special among the insects is their ability to turn their heads and use their exceptional vision to spot prey. The next order, the Siphonaptera, or the fleas, are also a well-known order because of the ones that feed on our dogs and cats, and even us. Now, the ones that feed on us, though, uh, rather, the ones that feed on our pets, though, are, are only two or three species out of the 2,000 that exist in the world. Fleas are exclusively blood feeders, but they feed on the blood of all sorts of different animals. There are many of them that feed on birds, some of them feed on reptiles, and even amphibians. Now one of the most well-known things about fleas is their jumping ability. In fact, for their size, they're able to jump over several hundred times their own body length, uh, which allows them to cover vast distances. Uh, another specialized feature of them 
is the fact that they are flattened, um, which uh, makes them very difficult to actually scrape off of your body if you're trying to scratch them off. Next up is one of my favorite smaller orders of insects. At just under 2,000 species, the Dermaptera, or the earwigs, uh, live underground or in the soil, especially under large rocks or logs. Now, it's a common misconception that earwigs will crawl into your ear and do all sorts of terrible things to you, but in fact, that's not actually true at all. They pretty much live harmlessly in the soil, and the most they can do is pinch you with their tiny little uh, pinchers on the back end of their body, which don't hurt at all. The next order is my absolute favorite order. It's called the Mecoptera, or the scorpion flies. Now, Mecoptera is built up of the words meco, meaning long, and optera, meaning wing, which refers to the fact that their wings are kind of long for their body. Um, they tend to have all sorts of amazing stripes and spots and patterns all over their wings, and in Mississippi, we have over 20 species of them. Now, the most noticeable thing about the Mecoptera is that the males have what looks almost exactly like a scorpion's tail hanging over the hind end of their body. However, it's totally harmless, it's a total coincidence, and they can't actually use it to sting anything. Mecoptera tend to live in well-forested areas in the shade among low-growing broadleaf plants, where they will wait around for things to either poop on the plants or for insects to fall out of the upper layers of the forest and fall onto the plants where they can eat them. And they tend to have these really long beaks on their heads which allow them to feed inside of these fruits and other fallen things without obscuring their eyes so that they can watch out for predators. The next order that I want to discuss is the Odonata. Now the Odonata are really familiar to humans as both the dragonflies and the damselflies. You can find them in areas especially around freshwater, but they can be found pretty much all over the place wherever there's vegetation. Now odonates are interesting because they are fast and agile predators of other flying insects, and I've seen myself dragonflies and damselflies snatching other insects out of the air that are flying just as fast as they do. Now the two main groups of them, the dragonflies and the damselflies, are mostly distinguished based off of their size. Dragonflies are more well known, they tend to be bulky and large, and regularly get to about three to five inches in length. Whereas the damselflies, even though they're just as common, they're not as well known because they tend to be more slender, more hidden, um, and they tend to live in deeper forested type habitats. But one of the largest odonates in the world is actually a damselfly with over a seven inch wingspan. Now the thing that makes the damselflies and dragonflies unique is the age of their order. They're an extremely old order and unlike most other insects, they hold their wings out horizontally um, or at a right angle to their body all of the time and don't ever fold them up close to the body. Our final order that we're going to be discussing today is the Megaloptera. Now they used to be part of the Neuroptera, but as we learned more about their genetic lineage, we found that they are separate from them. Now the Megaloptera look just like large lace wings, but they tend to live underneath the water uh, as larvae. Whenever they come out as adults, they're often attracted to lights, and they tend to live in areas that are close to streams and ponds and lakes. The most fascinating member of the Megaloptera is an insect called a Dobson fly which most people have never seen before, but are shocked by whenever they see it. They can get up to three or four inches long and they can have enormous jaws on the males. Sometimes the jaws are so large that the males can't even use them for fighting or for feeding or anything. They're simply used for showing off to the females. So that is the end of the groups of insects that we are going to be talking about today. There are a handful of others that we are not going to cover. And remember, if you have questions about those, please let us know and we will try and get resources to you about those a little more obscure kinds of insects. We have seen all of these in the state. Uh, they are Insects as a whole are incredibly diverse, very interesting. I hope that this is helpful to you in learning to identify basic groups of insects 
and that may help you feel more confident in identifying things in the future just when you're curious or may need to know what something is to help you figure out how to deal with it. If you have questions or comments, we would love to hear from you in uh, the comment section below on our social media. We are always looking for ways to help people learn what they want to about insects. Thank you so much for joining us today and we hope to see you tomorrow.